we talked about men and women who dream, right? And it's kind of cool because we also sang the song, Men and Women Who Dream, right? And today we're going to look at something that's also one of the songs we sing in our songbooks. It's the song, Great Among the Nations. Let me read the lyrics for us. Isaiah saw that it would come beginning from Jerusalem. In the last days to every tongue, to every nation. Daniel saw through prophets' eyes a kingdom that would never die. A mountain that would fill the earth, a rock that would endure. The scholars, they looked for him in vain. Their earthly king, he never came. Instead, a carpenter would start a kingdom of the heart. Beaten, bruised, he stretched his hands as God became a dying man. And king on cross was sacrificed for the church, his bride. And now this kingdom is our own. We bow before his heavenly throne and pledge our lives to his great cause to seek and save the lost. And everywhere and every word we share with all who have not heard about the truth that sets men free, which prophets long to see. That would be great among the nations, a fire from a spark. So great among the nations, bringing sunlight to the dark and offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. Among the nations, there would be a movement that would change eternity. And what's so awesome, family, is this is a song about God's kingdom. This is a song about a group of men and women who truly would go among the nations and really become a movement that changes eternity. Family, this is a song about all of us in this room this morning changing eternity. Amen. And we truly need to be that movement that changes eternity. Amen. Amen. The title of today's lesson is Great Among the Nations. And we'll have three points to our lesson today. And it comes from the chorus of the song. Point number one, a fire from a spark. Point number two, bringing sunlight to the dark. And point number three, offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. Let's begin with our first point. A fire from a spark. Turn with me to Mark chapter 3, and we'll begin here. I don't know about you, but uh, I love fire. I don't really have a good explanation as to why. I don't quite understand it, but as a kid at forever, I've always just been attracted to fire. Um, just love burning things, loving matches, loving being outside and burning tree branches and just, there's just something I feel like that's in me that just wants fire some, for some reason, you know? I, I just think it's the coolest thing. I don't know, I think that you know, you're called a pyro, right? If you like fire, you know what I mean? I just love fire. There's something, I love burning candles in my house, things like that, you know, just, there's just something, I don't know, spiritual, but powerful about fire, you know what I mean? And there's just something so powerful about it. And what's so great too, you know, when you think of fire, and in the song it says, a fire from a spark, and that's so true, right? You can have an incredibly huge, powerful fire from just one little spark. That's all it takes to get it going, right? And it's so incredible, I think, when you think of a wildfire, just something powerful and burning and spreading, a fire from a spark, you look at the first century church in the book of Acts. The first century church really was a crazy wildfire that spread all over the known world, the Roman Empire, and truly was a fire that was literally lighting up the nations and spreading rapidly. And I think what's so great, you know, when we read through, if you read through the book of Acts here in the scriptures, when you read all 28 chapters, you see the church. It's alive. It's moving. It's growing. And I don't think there's any Christian who reads the book of Acts and doesn't want their church to look like the book of Acts in the scriptures right there, right? And when you read that, you just go, man, I, that, that's what I want our church to be. Just, it's incredible seeing what it did. I mean, in Jerusalem, very quickly after the church started, there's 5,000 men in the church in Jerusalem. The church spread like a wire, wildfire. 
But you don't get a fire without the spark. And the spark that started that fire was Jesus Christ himself 2,000 years ago. And what did he do? He was the spark that got the fire going. But what's crazy to think about is he wasn't there physically when the church turned into a crazy wildfire. He was the spark but after he ascends back to heaven, that's when we see in the scriptures and history where the church truly spread like a fire. So what did he do? Jesus was the spark, but what he did is he took 12 men and he put that same spark in all of their hearts. And when he put 12 other sparks in their hearts, even though he ascends back to heaven, these 12 men were ready to go change the world and light a fire around the nations. Amen, guys. Amen. And let's look at what Jesus did, starting a fire from a spark. Look at Mark chapter 3. Come on, come on. In verse 13, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. That's a good nickname right there. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Let's stop right there. Point number one, a fire from a spark. Jesus spends all night praying. And then after the all night of praying, he then calls together his disciples, but then he calls together specifically 12 men that he then calls them to be his apostles, which means his messengers. He calls these 12 together. It says these are the guys he wanted. They came to him and he says the plan was is that they would be with Jesus and then that he would then send them out to go preach and drive out demons. And then it lists the 12 men who became the apostles. And what's so awesome is Jesus started with these 12 guys. He focused on these few men right here. He turned them into incredible leaders so that even though he left and went back to heaven, these 12 men were ready to do exactly what Jesus did with them. And for us, if we're going to have a fire from the spark, we got to believe in this plan of Jesus to raise up apostles in his church. And I think something we got to have in our hearts is that we, we love the book of Acts. The book of Acts is such an inspiring example of what the church can be. But we also have to understand, we don't get the book of Acts without the 12 apostles. Therefore, if, if we're not seeing the book of Acts in our life, in our ministry, in our church, it means there's not the 12 apostles that will bring that book of Acts. So if we're going to see the book of Acts in the West region, what we need is we need some men and women apostles in the West region. Are you with me right here? And what's so awesome is, you know, you, you read in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20, Jesus has spent three to four years with his 12 guys. He's then arrested, betrayed. All of his guys leave him and fall away from him. He then is crucified. He conquers death. He resurrects. And then he says, meet me on that mountain in Galilee. I'm like, okay. So they leave Jerusalem and... They go to Galilee, and they, this must be the spot he said to meet him at. And we used to eat up here and do Bible talk on this mountain and stuff. So this must be the mountain he wants us to be at. And you can just imagine at this point, it's only the 11 faithful apostles. And you can just imagine they're up on that mountain just waiting with anticipation of Jesus' big plan. Like, man, he conquered death. I can't wait to kick these Romans out of here. This is going to be awesome. Man, I, can't, I, I, bet, I bet Jesus spent all three days in the tomb just thinking of the perfect plan. Like, he's going to give us a nice detailed list, this thing, then this thing, and, then, and we got a nice step-by-step -step plan. It's going to be great. Jesus shows up on the mountain. Some still doubt, even though he resurrected. It says still some doubted, right? Then some worshiped, right? And then... He goes, guys, all authority, I have it. Here's the plan. Just go to all the nations, make disciples, 
and I'll be with you. I'm going to go now. And I could, I could, I wouldn't expect some confusion on the apostles' part right there. You know what I mean? Like, excited, just what's the plan? Like, tell us where to go, what to do, what do we got to do? And he basically shows up and says, you guys are the plan. He says, that's my plan. He goes, you've been with me, you know, for a few years now. I've shown you everything. I've trained you. I've shown you how to do Bible talk. I showed you how to study the Bible with these guys over here. He goes, I've shown you everything you need to know. You are just like me right now. So all you got to do is pick a country and get busy. He says, my plan, my soul, and it's barely a plan. That was the plan. He just go to countries and make disciples. That's it. That's barely a plan. But he says, the plan doesn't rest in how you're going to do it. The plan rests in the fact that I made you like me. And he says, you can take any of my guys, just take any of my apostles, stick them in a country, come back in three to four years, and that country will be starting to be evangelized. And he says, that's it. They, you know what to do because you've been raised up to be a leader just like Jesus. And he says, just send that guy anywhere, and there will be a church saving souls in that country. That's Jesus' plan. That is our plan. Amen, guys? And for us, we can't just believe in the plan of Jesus. We got to walk out of here convinced that there is no other plan except making leaders that evangelize the world in our day. Amen, guys? And I think for us, we, we, what are we doing? We're, 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 we're trying to spread a fire all over Los Angeles and West LA. Amen, guys? And the way we're going to get this fire spreading everywhere is we need leaders to go and start these fires in these different cities. We need apostles to raise up powerful men and women to learn to be like Jesus in the way he leads so that we can continue to spread the fire. I'm so grateful for all of the great leaders we have in the West region, all of the awesome Bible talk leaders, the house church leaders, the shepherds we have, the paid interns we have. These are incredible men and women that there's nothing awesome about them. They've just chosen to be used by God in a powerful way to keep spreading the fire. And I think right now in the West region, we have 10 awesome Bible talk families in the West region. What we need to do this year is we need to go from 10 to 20 Bible talks this year. The only question you might be asking, well, Richie, well, where are those other Bible talk leaders? The good news is we already got them. They're all right here in this room right here. We already have 10 more Bible talk leader couples. We just need the men and women to step up and answer the call to become an apostle to evangelize all of West L.A. Amen. A little bit about my wife and I. We've been Christians for about 10 years now, and when we first became Christians, we were so excited and great. We still are, but definitely at first, like, this is amazing. But we had not the slightest desire to lead anything. Not the slightest desire. My wife, girlfriend at the time, my wife, she, she had done different leadership roles, you know, in worldly settings and, you know, not, out, you know, outside of the church and had horrific experiences trying to lead anything. Not that she's incompetent, but just the way it went was just so horrible. Me, myself, I just had bigger plans that just revolved around, around me, you know, and so I had no desire to lead. I, I was just like, yeah, I might do something eventually, but, you know, I'm just going to live my life, you know, and do what I got to do. And I remember we would often be asked to come to the afternoon Bible talk leaders meeting, you know, in the afternoon. And I just remember declining all the time. No, sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty tired, you know. I mean, I know I don't have a wife or kids or a real job or anything, but, you know, I need to go take a nap. I mean, I'm pretty tired, you know. I mean... <laughs> It's not easy just showing up to church and being given to every week, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's, I mean, you want me to just sit there for two, that's tiring to just sit and be given to for two hours. Like, man, I need a rest, dude. Goodness gracious. And there's just this selfishness in both of our hearts where we were just like, no, church is working really well serving me right now, so... I don't want to mess that up, you know, it just, everything seems to be going really nice, you know, and 
I mean, you guys are singing great. The Bible talk seems to be doing fine without us. And uh, I don't really see any need to do mess that up. You know, like, why would I want to mess up everything? So. And what we had, we really had, you know, like, if you ever seen the movie Lion King, you know, what we had is what I like to call a Hakuna Matata attitude. Like, Simba, just stop worrying about stuff. Hakuna Matata, dude, just no worries. Don't worry about the kingdom, that it's falling apart. Hakuna Matata. Take life easy. Just eat your food. Eat the little, you know, you're a lion, even though we made you vegetarian, you know what I mean? And just, he's just like, just easy. Just, you know, what's so bad? No urgency. Just Hakuna Matata, right? And I knew, you know, and I was asked to lead a Bible talk. I remember. Richie, how do you feel about leading your first, like, campus Bible talk at Arizona State University? Do you want to lead a Bible talk? No, I don't. <laughs> it was, it was, I felt really bad because it was, it was very embarrassing. It was just for the guy asking me. I was like, do you want to, do you want to lead a Bible talk? You know, we need to get new, new Bible talk. And what was so crazy is that the entire, and, and at the time, the campus ministry at that time at ASU, everyone had just left to actually leave Phoenix to come plant the south region of the LA church over here. So everyone who knew how to do anything, lead a Bible talk, do a Bible study, you know, it was just like, they all left and there was like nine of us who barely knew anything about anything. It was like, hey, have you, have you heard of the Word of God Bible study? No, what's that? <laughs> you should lead a Bible talk, bro. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of where it was at. I was like, well, you'll figure it out. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to lead a Bible talk. And then the next question came, well, can you? Well, I guess I can. Yeah, sure. Amen. So then I got my heart behind it. But what I knew, I knew that the moment, the moment that I agreed to start leading anything, I knew that would mean that I would have to stop thinking of myself first. I knew the moment I had to lead anything, I would then have to start thinking about other people more and first before myself. And my selfishness did not want that. I go, I'm too busy focusing on me. How could I lead anything? And obviously there was selfishness, there was laziness, there was just a, a lack of gratitude in my heart for the kingdom. And because of that, I didn't want to lead. But what was awesome is that through some discipling, through a lot of repentance and learning, I then changed my heart. My wife changed our heart. And we got learned how to lead. We, we were taught how to lead some Bible talks in the kingdom. Amen, guys. And I think, honestly, I think that's where a lot of us, some of us can, can wrestle in our hearts. Well, hold on. If I start leading, then that means I have less time for myself. You're exactly right. And to know that and to not do something about it is sin in our hearts. It's the sin of selfishness. It's the sin of ingratitude because someone had to step up and lead in order for you to become a Christian. And if they had that same selfishness that maybe some of us might have, then you might not be here today as a Christian. The selflessness that has come before us, we must also have the same selflessness to step up and to lead and help other people. Which is why Jesus says the first will be last and the last will be first. What does that mean? It means those who think of themselves last will be the first ones to do something. But the ones who think of themselves first will be the last one to do anything for anyone else. And for us in the West region, we need to make apostles so we see the book of Acts in our region. Are you with me, guys? We got to believe. Believe in this plan of leadership. Ten Bible talks won't get the job done for West L.A. It's a start. It's some ten sparks, but we need more sparks than that to light a fire over Los Angeles. We need men and women saying, I'm not more interested in my own life. I'm more interested in the agenda of the kingdom and what God wants in his kingdom. We need men and women stepping up saying, I will do more when others don't want to do more. Yeah. We need men and women stepping up and saying, I will choose to carry a heavier cross for my life. We need men and women saying, I will be more tired, but still more grateful when I serve God's people and when I go after lost souls. 
We need to step up everyone in this room so we can continue to spread the fire over West Los Angeles. If you're not leading a Bible talk, I want to challenge you. If you're not leading a Bible talk yet, have the dream and start praying, even if you don't understand the prayer or what that means. God, I'm supposed to be a Bible talk leader. I don't know what that means. I don't even really want to. But I heard it's a good idea to pray about it. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a start. That's cool. That's okay. That's a start. But pray that your heart is filled with gratitude and not selfishness. And pray that if you're not leading a Bible talk, that you'll be leading a Bible talk by the end of 2019. Start praying that now. If you're leading a Bible talk, I want to challenge you. Lead your Bible talk as if the movement of God depends on how you lead your Bible talk. Could you imagine if all 10 Bible talks were leading their Bible talk as if it's the only Bible talk in the movement of God? Could you imagine just the urgency, the faith, just the, the lifestyle, the selflessness that would come if it was only all up to your people right there? The challenge I want to give us is to be those sparks that spread like a wildfire. And today we have a great opportunity. It's called Bible Talk Leaders Meeting. <laughs> Bible Talk Leaders Meeting. I am personally inviting every single person to be at Bible Talk Leaders Meeting, which is great. And you're like, well, bro, I don't lead a Bible talk. Exactly. That's why you got to come. You got to learn how a Bible talk is led. And every Christian... According to the scriptures, every Christian that goes on to maturity is a leader that leads someone. To remain not leading anyone ever, not even leading one other person, the Bible says is spiritual immaturity and you will eventually fall away from God. Because what happens is, is you ultimately, you never repent from a selfishness in your heart, which eventually leads to totally focused on self, you forget God, and you'll eventually walk away from God in your heart. But what's so great is that with Jesus' plan as the only plan, all of us can mature and be great leaders in God's kingdom. Come to leaders meeting today, and we're going to make a little change. Instead of it doing it at 2.30, we'll do it at 2 p.m. I think we're a little ahead of schedule, which is great. So 2 p.m. leaders meeting over there. Amen, guys? Let's be the fire by starting with the sparks. Amen. Let's move on to point number two. Point number two. Bringing sunlight to the dark. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Let's read verses 9 through 10. Bringing sunlight to the dark. Here we go. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's stop right there. Point number two, bringing sunlight to the dark. The Apostle Peter is writing here and he's writing to the church and he's reminding them of who they are as disciples. He goes, guys, you're a chosen people, meaning God prefers you. God is interested in you. He wants you. You are chosen. And he goes, if that's not good enough, you're a royal priesthood. He goes, you are literally in the royal family of Jesus. Meaning every man and woman in God's kingdom is a royal prince and a royal princess in God's royalty family. He goes, you're royalty. He goes, well, if that's not enough, you're a holy nation. You're a, you're a righteous, set apart, special country. Isn't that so cool? We are all part of the country of Christianity, right? <laughs> And then he goes, well, even more, you belong to God. 
And anything that belongs to God, God makes awesome and takes care of. You know what I'm talking about? He goes, guys, you're, you're chosen. You're royal. You're a holy country. You belong to God. Not that so you can just sit there and do nothing, but so that you can declare the praises of God who called you out of darkness. He says, you are all these things, not because you're awesome, but so you can tell everyone how awesome God is, right? He says, God called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, he goes, before you were a Christian, you weren't even a person. You weren't even a people. He's like, he's like you're nothing. He's like, we were nothing in darkness. He says, but now you are the very special people of God. Once you had no mercy, now God has given you his mercy. And just in these two verses right here, I mean, it really should just make you sit up a little straighter when you start thinking about who you are, right? Like, wow, I am a prince. You know what I'm talking about? Like, God really does love me. That's awesome. It, it gives you a confidence. You start walking a little bit different. You start thinking, of, you, you show up to work a little bit different. You know what I'm talking about? But if you, if you feel discouraged or you just feel like, oh, I'm, uh, what I do doesn't matter. I think th what you might be forgetting is that you are a royal prince and princess in God's kingdom. God wants us. Despite all of our wicked shortcomings and mistakes, God says, I want you. And it says we have come from darkness and he's called us into his beautiful, wonderful light. Jesus talks about light and darkness as well. He describes it in John 3. And he says, light has come into the world, but men love darkness. He says, light's here. Light, everyone can be in the light. The issue is they just don't want to be in the light. He says, the issue is, is too many people don't want to be seen. He says, men hate the light and they love darkness because if they come into the light then all of their evil choices and decisions will be exposed and seen by everyone but he says those who love the truth those who love truth come into the light Amen. and i know for me i, I my, my life was total darkness before i became a christian i know last sunday i shared a little bit more about you know my life prior to becoming a disciple and Man, my life, I was a slave to lust, a slave to impurity, a slave to hatred and selfishness. And my life was filled with darkness. But God called me out of darkness into the light so we can declare to others in the darkness that we can be set free from these things that enslave us in the darkness. And I think, you know, if you're visiting with us this morning, don't love darkness. Hate darkness. Hate darkness. Come into, choose to be in the light if you're visiting with us this morning. Choose to be in the light. And it's crazy too if you think about it. Even in the physical sense, sunlight is healthy and darkness is unhealthy. In the physical sense. Just the way God designed us. It's so crazy how it's similar to spirituality right here, right? In the sunlight, it can help reduce risk of cancer. It can help your heart. It can help your eyes, your eye health. It can boost your immune system. It lowers your blood pressure and it helps your muscles. If you have a good amount of sunlight, vitamin D in your life, which is great. If you don't get enough sunlight and you live in too much darkness, you can develop heart disease, cancer, clinical depression, memory loss, dementia, and schizophrenia. Too much darkness can bring on these physical ailments into your body. And so what does that mean? Well, if we love darkness, if we hide our deeds, if we're not willing to bring light into our life, then we start walking around with a little bit of spiritual dementia, which means we start forgetting about who Jesus was and what he did for us. And then we start doing really strange, uncalculated things, and then we might start even getting a, a spiritual schizophrenia to where it just, it's unexplained, and we don't even understand why we may do the things we choose to do. Because what we're doing is we're just little by little, we're just allowing a little darkness into our life, a little more and a little more, and then we just have learned to walk in the dark. And we've just gotten really good just kind of being blind, but feeling around and somehow making it through day by day. 
And we got to get a conviction in our hearts, family, that not once in the light, always in the light. Once in the light, we got to strive to continue to walk in the light. Amen, church. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. And I love this passage here in 1 John 1 in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Let's stop right there. The scripture teaches us, it says, we got to understand, God is light. There's no darkness at all. Therefore, if us as his children, if we claim to have fellowship with God, yet our life has hidden parts to it, parts that we don't want anyone to know, parts that we know are ungodly but no one knows about, it says, then we call God a liar, and then we lose all fellowship with God. And then it goes on, it says, but if we, if we confess our sins, if we walk in the light, if we just choose to just be honest with who we are and where we are, and not try to hide or put up any fake anything, if we're just real with who we are, the blood of Jesus purifies you from all of those sinful things that you might have done, and then you get fellowship with God, and then you get fellowship with one another. Meaning, you can't, we can't have fellowship with anyone, true fellowship. Fellowship is more than just a five-minute fellowship break in church on Sunday, right? <laughs> fellowship is living with each other, walking with each other, loving one, literally living life together. And if we choose to let darkness stay in our life purposefully, you then have nothing in common with anyone around you. You lose all fellowship with God and fellowship with each other when we choose to walk in darkness. But if we confess our sins, Jesus' blood purifies us. And then we walk in light. And then we then have fellowship with our brothers and sisters. And it's so powerful because what happens is, is you start realizing, oh, wow, I'm not in this alone. Okay, oh, wow, you, you have similar struggles. Wow. I'm not happy for you, but that's encouraging that we're in this together. You know what I mean? I'm not happy you fell short, but... At least I know I'm not weird that I have shortcomings. You know what I mean? And I think for us guys, I think if any of us came here this morning feeling lonely, it's because there's darkness in your life. You've, you've begun to lose fellowship with the family. The family is trying to strive to be in the light. Though far from perfect, we're striving to walk in the lights. If you feel lonely, not apart, not, not with, not connected, it's because we don't have fellowship with maybe who you are because you're acting like everything's great when really inside you lost fellowship with God and for some reason we automatically lost fellowship with you. And now you're lonely and you go, oh, church doesn't love me. Oh, you don't care about me. And it's like, no, like, you're lonely because we don't know who you are anymore. You're lonely because you don't tell us anything about your life. You, you're, 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 you're claiming to be in the light, yet walking in darkness, which explains the lack of peace and anxiety and why you won't hug me anymore at church. It's because even though we have fellowship break, it's very clear by the look in your eyes that the light has gone out of your eyes. I'm very concerned, but I love you to death, dude. I love you to death, but let's just be honest with each other. Like, you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, none of us are perfect. My goodness, this is a church of a bunch of messed up people. We're a church of messed up people, but we're a church that's family. 
that we love each other through it. And, and it's so awesome. I mean, because then you start realizing, wow, I'm not in this by myself. We're all in this together. This is awesome. Wow, I want to be even more righteous now. And I want to help this guy be righteous too. This is all. Let's hold each other. And then fellowship gets created naturally. Fellowship is a natural thing that just happens when we all walk in the light. And on Wednesday night, the brothers came together for our men's midweek on Wednesday. And we looked at this passage. We looked at some other passages. And I said, guys, tonight we're going to have a night where we all walk out of here in the light. And so we came together. We split up. Uh, we split up a single, married, campus. And we had a nice time of just openness, confession, being real with each other. And let me tell you, the fellowship after all of that was incredible. As we all walked out of there in the light. And what's so amazing is as one brother is confessing his sin, then the other brother is like, well, we, we, wow, we're, we're like the same kind of guy. This is encouraging. Like, wow, I thought I was the only one who struggled with, wow, this is so awesome. Wow, you struggle with that too. That's great. Wow, we can both go after this thing together. And then fellowship comes, which is such an incredible gift God has given us in his royal family. Amen, guys. And I'm very excited because on Wednesday, I've talked to Elizabeth about it. And uh, on Wednesday, the sisters will come together for their midweek. And you guys are going to have an awesome time to everyone walk out of there in the light with each other. Everyone to just get open with everything. Be honest. Be real. And to start 2019 really with a clean slate, a fresh start, totally walking in the light. God's kingdom brings sunlight to the dark. If there's any darkness in your life purposefully, if there's something you're choosing to hide, don't do so any longer. Let it go. Jesus already paid the price for what you're holding on to. He already paid the price. Let him have it. Let go of it. Let go of it. Be open and you'll experience an incredible amount of love, grace, mercy, help, encouragement, and healing when we bring sunlight to the darkness. Amen, family? Let's close out with our third and final point. Point number three, offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. So let me just tell you what this whole last little chunk is going to be all about here. This last little chunk is going to be about saving souls. So as we, as we read the scripture, as I start talking about stuff, just think about everyone that you need to talk to to bring to church and to study the Bible with, okay? Offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. And let's keep in our heart, under, underlying all this is our cranking Bring Your Neighbor Day next Sunday. Amen, guys. Matthew 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Let's stop right there. Offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. We get a little commentary here on Jesus' ministry, this little description of what he'd been doing. We don't know how long it was as he was doing this, but it says he was going through different towns, going through different villages, different neighborhoods. He's in the synagogues. He's preaching the good news of the kingdom. And then he's also physically healing diseases and sicknesses in people's lives. We don't know how long it's going on for, but it goes on for some time. And then at the end of it, Jesus comes to a very inspiring but convicting conclusion after this journey through these towns and villages. It tells us, number one, that he has compassion on them. And he looks at them and he says, all of these people can become Christians. The only issue is we don't have enough workers to go and bring them to the Good Shepherd. I mean, what, what a... What a 
crazy conclusion to come to. I don't know about you, but maybe if, if I was in Jesus' shoes at this point, and I was going town after town after village after village and synagogue and synagogue, all these diseases, all these sicknesses, the, the, these guys have no leader, they're just like lost random sheep. I might, I don't know, but my flesh might be tempted to go, yeah, you know, here's the thing, disciples, these guys are messed up in these places. Like... I think, I think we just got to keep looking in other towns, find some people. I mean, they're all sick. They're all diseased. They have no idea up from down. They're helpless. I mean, I don't know if there's any hope for these guys. I mean, that would be like a normal, natural kind of conclusion to come to. Like when you see just the facts of the situation, you go, oh my good, this is a really bad situation. What's amazing, though, is Jesus doesn't even come near that at all. <laughs> he looks at everyone. He goes, I have so much compassion for these people. He goes, they're harassed, they're helpless. But man, the harvest is so plentiful. There's so many people who want to hear the good news. He goes, our only problem, our only problem, it's, it's not that people are messed up. He goes, our problem is not that people are, are lost. It's our problem is not that they're helpless or harassed. No, our only problem is we don't have enough people who want to go help them. That's our only problem. Come on. And guys, the problem 2,000 years ago is the same problem today with humanity. Is that there's not enough people who care enough about people. Wow. There's not enough people who are willing to work and push themselves in order to help somebody else. And Jesus says the workers are few. That's our problem. But he says, I got a solution. Pray for workers. <laughs> he says, that's the solution. Just ask the Lord of the harvest to just send out workers into the field. He goes, that's what we got to do. And I could just imagine the apostles and the disciples were like so fired up about that. Like, Jesus, what a great idea. Why didn't we think of that sooner? I mean, we're in like chapter nine. Like, what a great idea. We're sitting here working really hard and stuff. I mean, man, we should have just prayed for a bunch of guys to go into the harvest field. Like, what a great idea. We'll go pray right now. So I can imagine they go pray, and you know, Peter's praying. He's like, God, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the rock. I just pray for a lot of people like awesome as me. You know what I mean? And I, I could just imagine the, the sons of thunder, like, God, you, you, you know who we are. Like, we, we just need to pray for people who are willing to have compassion on all these messed up people to go help those guys. Jesus said, pray for workers, so that's what we're doing. It's a good idea. Send some people to help those guys. I don't know if that's where they're at, but, you know, maybe a couple guys had that kind of heart. I don't know. But what's amazing is Jesus calls them back together. If you look in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, He called the 12 disciples to him. He gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. And then drop down to verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. And he tells them to go on out, preach the word, and heal diseases and sicknesses. And it's so awesome. The 12 come back and then Jesus goes, guys... How did it go? How was, how, how was the praying for the workers? And they go, Jesus, it was amazing. From Peter's prayer alone, we're getting like 10 workers to go help these guys. Well, amen, that's great. And then you go, yeah, from James and John, their prayer, they're getting at least like 12 guys to come help these lost souls over here. He goes, guys, that's amazing. Now, here's the thing. And Jesus goes, guys, the good news is God answered your prayers. And they're like, oh my gosh, where are the workers? He goes, guys, good news. You are the workers. He goes, this is amazing. Like you guys prayed for workers and God answered by all 12 of you being workers. You, know, this is, you answered your own prayer. How cool is that? So here's what I need you to do. I need you to get out of here and go preach the word. <laughs> so he kicks them out and they go preach. He gives them authority to preach the word and heal diseases and sicknesses. And for us, we got to be those workers that God wants in all of us. Amen. We can't just be praying for things to happen in the church, praying for people to be met, praying for things to grow or praying for this. We need to be praying. Absolutely. But you then need to be acting upon what you believe can happen. Right. We, you, amen. You, you, you got to you got to believe that God wants to answer your prayers with you. He wants to answer the prayers for your Bible talk with you. He goes, the harvest is plenty. There's tons of people. We just need more people willing to go out there and talk to those people, right? And Jesus describes them as harassed and helpless. And I know I can wrestle with this, but sometimes I think one of my weaknesses is, is having a genuine compassion on people. Whether I know them or not know them, that, that's, 
That's my flesh. I, I always have to remember, have compassion. Jesus has compassion. That's who I need to be. And I think if we're not sharing our faith, if we're not trying to bring friends to a Bring Your Neighbor Day, not trying to bring friends to a Bible talk, study the Bible, it might be because you don't have compassion on the people you see. It could be you might be starting to believe that their life is just fine without Jesus. Or worse, that you might start thinking their life is actually better than yours without Jesus. And they go, well, I mean, if I invite them, now they're going to start have to come to church. You know, if I invite them, then, you know, they'll, they'll have to start giving contribution. And maybe, maybe they're better off without God. And we can get in some weird places in our heart if we don't remember what this is all about. And the words Jesus has used to describe lost souls, he says, harassed and helpless. Harassed literally means to have your skin flayed off of you. Helpless literally means to be thrown out like unwanted garbage. So when Jesus sees the people, he goes, these guys are, are they're broken hearted. He goes, Satan is totally tearing their lives apart, sending them to hell. He's deceived them. He's leading the world astray. And he's taking the lives of men and women and children, and he's throwing them out like garbage. And the torture they live with every day is as if every day their skin is being peeled off of their body. Pray for workers. And I think sometimes if we don't understand or really believe that that's where lost men and women are, which is where all of us were before yeah. we were Christians. Yeah. Come on, bro. If we forget that, we lose touch with that, we don't sense any urgency yeah. to bring them to the shepherd. And living in beautiful Southern California, living in wonderful Los Angeles, and even more so living in amazing West Los Angeles, yeah. it can be easy to think that people's lives are real good without God. But let me just remind us, and let me just help us remember how brokenhearted the world is that we live in. Every two minutes, there's a sexual assault on someone. By the end of our church service today, from start to finish, 60 people will have been sexually assaulted. Every 11 minutes, Child Protective Services finds a child sex abuse claim. 12 kids will have been sexually abused by the end of our service today. Sad part is, 88% of those claims are from the parents as the perpetrators. In college, 11% of all college women will experience some kind of sexual assault through force or violence. So when you're walking on campus and you're in your class, there's 100 people in your lecture, 10 of those people will be forcefully or violently assaulted sexually of those women. One out of six of every woman has already been a victim of attempted or completed rape in their life. In the emergency room of hospitals, of all the women that go to emergency rooms, a third of all the women in the ER are there from injuries caused by domestic violence in their home. So if you're ever in the hospital, a third of the women, someone physically violently hurt them in their own house. In California alone, there's 431 abortions every day. So yesterday, 431 children were killed. And today, another 431. And in Los Angeles, LA County, two people every day commit suicide. So yesterday, in the beautiful weather we had yesterday, two people took their life. And again today, two more people will become convinced it's not worth living anymore and take their own life. 
the suicide rate in LA County surpasses the mortality rate for drug overdoses, homicide, and vehicle crashes. People are dying and taking their life more than car accidents, drug use, and murder. The sad part is, is as I was researching things, it, it says online, it says the solution to, ha to, 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 to suicide, we just need more awareness about it. Maybe that helps, maybe. But it doesn't, awareness doesn't heal broken hearts. And even yesterday, just looking on the news, in the state of Delaware, four kids, middle school aged, four kids, between 12 to 14 years old, four kids were arrested for kidnapping and raping one of their peers, a little girl. A 12 year old, a 12 year old boy got it in his heart with three other kids to kidnap and rape some 10 year old girl. And those four kids will grow up and it'll lead to other things. Fathers aren't raising their families anymore. Satan is ripping apart the lives of men and women. Guys, do not walk out of here thinking that we live in a beautiful, everyone's happy kind of world. Lives are being thrown out like unwanted garbage. The people in your neighborhood are being treated like unwanted trash. Your classmates, every day, are living like their skin is being flayed off of their bones. Helpless, harassed, completely broken hearted. And I know all of us, before someone showed us, Jesus, through the Gospels, through God's Word, all of us were very broken hearted, very lost, had no purpose, had no hope. Yet someone decided to work a little harder that day. Someone decided to stay up a little, someone decided to not go home as early, and they talked to us. And I think what's so great, guys, is we have this awesome opportunity here of Bring Your Neighbor Day to bring a bunch of broken-hearted friends to come hear the good news from the Good Shepherd. Amen, guys? And we got to be praying and fasting for God to use us in powerful ways. I want to give some direction here for us this week. So we, we have our Bible talks this week. What I want to ask all the Bible talk leaders to do is to use... The time that you normally gather with your Bible talk, use that time that evening to go out and just share your faith with some broken hearts in your neighborhood. Amen, guys? Amen. To go out there and share your faith together as a family, believing that they're harassed and helpless and you're offering salvation to those broken hearts. Amen. And I also want to challenge us to keep praying and fasting. You know, this past week, I, I did this week, I, I, you know, I humbled myself before God, and I did a, a fruit and veggie fast this week, which was awesome, and just praying for God to bring fruitfulness in my life and everyone else's lives, and, and it was great, you know, UCLA has started up, so I was over there with, uh, with some of the folks at UCLA, and, and I, was, I was fired up, I was able to meet five different guys that are very interested in studying the Bible and coming to church, which is great, and I want to encourage us to keep going after, keep praying and fasting. And so we really, we talked about it last week. We really want to get everyone for the Bring Your Neighbor Day to bring as many people as we can. We really want to get everyone committing to getting five people committed to coming with them to church on Sunday. So five, getting five people that say, yes, I want to come, I will be there. And if, if all 86 of us do that, we're going to have a lot of people come to church next Sunday. Amen, guys? And something I want to do, I want to push us. This is the year of boldness, isn't it? Right? It takes a little boldness to do some bold things, right? And through prayer and fasting, I think, you know, we got, we got five days in the week, right? You know, Monday through Friday, of course, we have Saturday as well. But let's just take the first five days of the week right here. And let's do some prayer and fasting together these five days. 
And I, what I want to do is I want to, I really want to challenge us to each get to, you know, an awesome little goal of five commitments. And so let's start each day praying and fasting each morning until we get one new commitment to come that day on Monday. So Monday morning, you wake up, you pray, God, you know, I, I, I love you. I want to be used by you. You know, I, I want to be the worker in your harvest field. God, help me find someone, a broken heart today that wants to come and hear the good news of Jesus. And you pray that and then you don't eat anything. But anytime you feel hungry, you just pray for God to help you find someone. Right. And, and then when you get that one commitment, they want to come. Then, amen. Maybe you celebrate with them with a cranky little meal. You got one more friend coming to bring your neighbor day. Amen. And then Tuesday, the same thing. You wake up. God, help me find a broken heart. Just one more today. One more broken heart. And each day you go and you pray and you fast until God gives you that one broken heart to come to bring your neighbor day. And I think if we all do that, could you imagine all 88 of us, 86 of us, I think, uh, getting five people to come to bring your neighbor day? It'll be incredible. And say, say you get all five people on Monday or Tuesday, then amen. You can keep going and praying and fasting if you want, but you can get more friends. But you hit five, amen, celebrate the Lord, help you reach your goal of five people, amen. And I think if we do that, guys, I think God's going to do incredible things in our region this year. And guys, don't ever underestimate the power of just one faithful prayer for God to use you. Don't ever underestimate how much God can use you through one prayer to save a broken heart. And I'll never forget the last thing I'll share here. I remember praying a prayer like that a few years ago. I remember praying, God, I pray on camp. This is up in Santa Barbara. I go, God, I pray that you just help me meet someone today that is looking for you, that wants you, that sees their need for you. Someone that wants to come and just learn about you. Amen. And I remember praying that, and then I went on to the campus, and I, the very first young man I, I talked to, I walked up to him and I said, do you know what the kingdom of God is? And he goes, no. He goes, let me tell you about what the kingdom of God is, right? And so he agreed to study the Bible. We sat down. The first time we sat down, he goes, you know, it's crazy. I had just prayed that morning that you talked to me that God would show me someone. And I'm, I need to find somewhere to go to know God better. And I was praying that God would send me somebody. And then I met you. I go, that's amazing. We studied the Bible. And, you know, it wasn't like a home run. He was ready to go. He had a lot of stuff going on in his life. There was a lot of substance abuse things. There was a lot of just sadness. He wrestled with suicidal thoughts and all these different things. And his heart was very broken where he was at. But after a few weeks, he studied the Bible, he became a disciple, he repented, and he got baptized, which was awesome. But it didn't stop there. After he got baptized, he then told his family about all this. He, he was called from darkness into the light, and he goes, I got to tell everyone about where I came from. This is awesome. He tells his family, and then his brother, he then studies, and then he becomes a Christian and gets baptized. After that, his, then his second brother studies the Bible, and then that guy gets baptized. After that, his mom studies the Bible, then she she gets baptized. After that, his ex-girlfriend studies, and then she got baptized. And after that, his dad studied, and he got baptized as well. His entire family became Christians. And I think it was through God just using one, one prayer. The prayer you pray tonight, the prayer you pray tomorrow, and the faith you, you have to go act upon it can save an entire family, if you believe it will. Family, let us be what God believes his church needs to be, which is great among the nations. Not because we're awesome, but because God is awesome, right? We got to be that fire from the spark. Let us be the men and women who raise up to lead and take charge in God's kingdom. Let us also bring sunlight to the dark, not living in darkness, but truly walking in the light with our brothers and sisters. And lastly, being convinced that we are offering salvation to a world of broken hearts. No one's happy out there. Everyone is broken hearted. We must be the movement that changes eternity. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Amen.